Now, there's a few slides uh, on the set of slides that we were walking through the last day that I want to uh, cover today. Uh, so it's the same set of slides, and it's this area of uh, data integrity, really, I guess you'd call it within Git. So even though when I started talking to you about Git, and um, we know now that uh, it creates a subfolder within your project called the .git folder, and that is the repository. And I would have said, you know, you never really need to look inside the repository. But that's exactly what we are going to do today. Um, I think it's beneficial to have an understanding of how Git stores data internally. Uh, it does help your understanding of what's going on when you're staging, committing, uh, uh, branching, and all of that stuff. So uh, we're looking inside Git now. And so the first point is that everything uh, that is stored, every file that is stored inside in Git, the first thing that Git does is it computes a checksum uh, using the SHA-1 algorithm. A checksum is just a, uh, well, I won't say it's randomly generated because it's not, but it's just a random looking uh, string of characters, but it actually represents the contents of the file after you've put it through an algorithm. And in, our, and in Git's particular case, it's the SHA-1 algorithm that it uses to compute this checksum or hash value for the file's content. So when you look inside a Git repository, you will never find any file with the same name as one of the files in your project. Uh, and that's because it doesn't store the file names inside in the repository, not as file names anyway. Instead, it stores your files uh, using the this uh, SHA-1 hash value instead. And we'll see that. So that's the first point. Uh, and it, uh, this is all really to guarantee the integrity of the data uh, in the repository, because if you store if somebody tries to maliciously change the contents of one of the files inside in the repository, and it's actually easy enough to try and find the, the files in there, uh, if they try and change them, then that means the content of the file will not match its SHA-1 uh, hash value, and Git will complain about that straight away. So it's a kind of a, it's a safety mechanism really built into Git. Uh, every now and again, I'm just going to check to see if David Ryan has actually joined us. Are you with us yet, David? I am indeed, yeah. All right. <laughs> I've landed. Sorry about that. We were getting disappointed there. From one, from one place to the other, Dermot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, just give me one second now. Um, yeah, built away, yeah. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing. Yep. And are you able to share your screen? I can, yeah. Just bear with me for a second now. Um, yeah, looks good. So okay. I'll, uh, I've actually told the students already, uh, David, that you're uh, going to be talking to them about the mentorship program in the Walton Institute. So you can yep. uh, just fire ahead, really, at your own time. Fire at will. So, yep. Thanks a million, Dermot. Thanks for the opportunity. So, um, I suppose myself, my name is David Ryan. I'm a software um, engineer in the Walton Institute. Um, so um, I'm not sure. Let's see, I just want to play, go forward. Nope, oh, one minute. Ah, yeah, okay. So the Walton Institute, how many people here on the call, I'm wondering, have heard of the Walton Institute? From the other classes, I reckon not too many, but we'll give you a... Uh, uh, a brief rundown anyway. So basically in the Walton Institute, we do uh, apply it. Uh, we apply basic ICT concepts to health, agriculture, transport, cybersecurity. There's some folks doing work on the brain and there's some doing work on, on the energy side of things. I suppose when we look at basic, hard to define the term basic, but I suppose it's um, there's a lot of high quality research going on up there. Um, we're recognized leaders in fundamental and commercial interdisciplinary research. So we're connected to such centers like Connect or Future Nero or Lero. 
and we do a lot of work in the European space with uh, European research and development um, programs. And so our international research, we're spread uh, across the globe pretty much um, in terms of our contacts. And we work from on projects um, in all these areas with a lot of these, a lot of these people, um, contacts far away as Australia even, and uh, some in the States. So our core focus areas, um, so in the networks and cloud side of things, uh, software defined networking, uh, quantum communications um, from the mobile, IO, mobile and IoT things. So a lot of I, IoT applications um the communications um software engineering so advanced software engineering services in the likes of mobile iot and some security um mixed reality we have an arv our lab and 3d our a, a 3d photogrammetry machine up there that takes pictures of 360 of an object and converts it into a 3d model that they put into their ar vr um, um applications um, e-textiles all the way into machine learning, predictive analytics, deep learning and neural networks. So the Walton Mentorship Program, what is it? I suppose I'm going to ignore this slide for a minute. I'm going to step back to nine years ago um, when I was in college here as, a, as a, an SSD um, student, oddly enough. And I had a, finally a project that was relatively ambitious. But I was kind of going about things a little bit wrong. So um, Eamon de Lester was, was, was a lecturer I had at the time, and he took an interest in the, in the project I was doing. And um, he, he asked me how I was going at it. I said, good and not so good. I was trying to install uh, a technology on a mobile device, a database on a mobile device that wasn't designed to go there. OK, so. I was after spending one week on it and was probably going to spend three or four more. And Eamon asked me, um, what, what do you plan to, to do with the data when you have it on the phone? When he found out that I was putting it in a database. And I said, I'm just going to hold it there and stage it there until, I'm, until my phone comes into Wi-Fi and then I'm going to send the data up to the cloud. So he said, you're not doing any processing. I said, no, just chucking it there, sending it up. So he said, why don't you write it to a flat file? Bingo. Write it to a flat file, send it up, then purge the file. Uh, the, 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 the OS on the mobile device will allow you to do that. Okay, so he saved me two weeks. And the point I'm making is that um, a researcher looks at a problem differently, okay, and can quickly spot where something can be improved or where a little bit of help might be needed. So the Walton Mentorship Program is going to offer up to 10 undergrad students from SETU, um, from the, Waterford Depar the Department of Computing in Waterford, support for finally a project. It provides access to um, internationally recognized researchers and gives the student a researcher's perspective on the core technical aspects. So it can look at your project in the, in the wider context basically real world scenarios, um, you know, is, is it applicable? Um, maybe can it be reworked slightly to make it way better and maybe more realistic in the real world and offer an advice and help that way. So at the aim is to support ambitious research minded students in raising the quality of the final year project. Also provides us researchers an opportunity to pass on our expertise to the next generation of future researchers, and also opens the doors of the Walton Institute to the next generation of researchers to show them the possibilities of a career in research. So what will it provide? Um, advice on their approach, like in my case, don't put a database on a phone. There's already one there, but why even look, deal with the overhead of a database when you can do things so much differently? Um, help with overcoming issues in developing software might be something simple. A software engineer would spot that a researcher may not, or that a student may not. Knowledge around the state of the art, the subject area, access to data to support the research if possible, advice on the development of reports. So let's say 
you you had a technical section on your report that you wanted a, a, a pair of expert eyes on it to see if it could be made better, to see if they, they, they can help some way in, in enhancing your report further with some advice, help with the design of an architecture or software, and access to internationally renowned researchers through project partners. The project I'm on at the moment has, has researchers in um, as, as far away as Finland, you know, uh, right from UCD in Dublin to Finland to some places in Germany to Greece. So they're all, they all have expertise that could be applicable. And the access to those is, would, would be, be, be really, really strong for a, for a student to have. So how to apply? Students will submit a one-pager description of their project. Um, and I haven't got it here to TJ McDonald um, by um, Wednesday. Now, I know it's a short time, but when I say one pager, I mean, it is just what is my project about? What I intend to do with it? How I intend to go about it? That's pretty much it. It doesn't have to be an essay or anything fancy. So then we will get the 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 one pagers and we'll have a look and see where we can where they can fit against the panel of mentors that we have we'll see some of those in a while and the students that enter will visit the walton institute for a tour of the data center the mixed reality labs or the textile labs to get to see the place um have a look around and and get a sense of what happens around there the students will then pitch their idea to a panel of researchers and receive feedback now when i say pitch it's not you guys are, are one of these standing up in front of us and going through the, the, your project in depth. It's more of sitting down with us and talking, us, talking to us about your idea, your motivation behind your idea, where you think you can go with it and where further you're looking to go with it and so on. And then we'll give you feedback and advice and how best to proceed. And then the mentors will pick a student that they can be more of more help to. And assign, and assign a mentor to each student. For the duration of their final year project, the mentor will meet the student for one hour each month. Key to this is that the student sets the agenda. So one week before, the student says, sends an email to the, to the mentor, say, you okay to meet me on X day? This is what I'd like to go through. Maybe send a snippet of the code, maybe an architecture diagram, maybe a portion of the report that you want them to look at, or maybe just an idea that they'd like sound, to soundboard or maybe to be help, help with the design of it by the, by the mentor. So on to the mentors. Um, I'm not going to read all these verbatim. I'm just going to give you a sense of what they do. So this is Derek. Derek is, um, he works in the data center. He does a lot of software defined networking, um, some software engineering. He's a systems administrator, does a lot of work with open st stack deployments. This guy here is probably, uh, I can consider him as a toolbox. <laughs> he's been in the, in the industry for 30 odd years, pretty much if, if I'm going to him to ask him a question, if he doesn't know, I'm, gone, I'm going to be Googling five or six pages down to find a half an answer. Um, Michael Kugel, who's in the data center as well, he works in the whole containerization. But his, when he was in college here, he was doing audio technology on the entertainment stream. So he does a lot of the networking side of things, does a lot of software to find the infrastructure, um, does a lot of work on the security pharmaceutical side of things as well. Philip O'Brien, who is doing a lot of work in AI and health at the moment. So he does a lot of the, the work on the machine learning, AI piece, um, voice analysis, natural language processing, and so on. But also a lot of the software engineering side of things and, and a lot of experience in AWS. So uh, John Ronan, who was probably the shortest um, bio here, but probably has the longest CV. He's vastly experienced. He's in the Walton for since 1990 something or other, uh, seven or eight. And his main areas are an IoT side of things, networking, um, does a lot of work with the whole communication side of things. 
and the software engineering as well. Um, Indrakshi, uh, she is my new division head. She's been there since January. She has a lot of experience in AI, digital twins, machine learning, software engineering. All of these people you see here are software engineers on top of being researchers in their, in their area. Niall Grant, who is a software engineer, um, does a lot of work with DevOps. He has a lot of experience in data analysis and AI and ML modeling. Uh, Niall works in the smart grid side of things, smart energy side of things with me. Uh, Darren Leniston, the same. He has a lot of uh, software engineering, um, state-of-the-art ICT and ICT architectures that kind of bridge the gap between research and, and industry. And then there's myself, and I just a general dog's body that does a bit of software engineering on the, on the side. So yeah, I suppose one thing to, to, to mention is that you've seen all these mentors and researchers there that have a vast experience in different areas. But I suppose one thing to explain about the, the, the likes of ourselves up there from day to day, we would be explaining some of the work we do to a professor in a university in wherever, or to somebody from a, a company that just comes in to talk to us that doesn't have any background in the relevant areas. So there is there is that, I suppose, ability to explain something very complex to somebody who might not have a good understanding of it, but similarly to be able to take something that's very basic, like maybe a, a, a problem with a finally a project and be able to take a researcher's mind to that and help the students get a, a better feel for it and help the student along their way. So I suppose um, that's it from me. Um, Dermot, is there the option for a student to ask a question? If they so wish, uh, there certainly is, David. Yeah, um, we we'll open the floor to them if they if they want to ask anything. Yeah, they usually don't talk to me either, so don't don't be offended by that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. So I suppose. Um, no, what I was going to say, uh, David, is um, I'll uh, it's if it's okay, I'll circulate the slides because I communicate yeah. with them through Slack. I'll circulate the slides and I'll include TJ's uh, email address as well. Um, yes, please. Yeah. And uh, it was interesting how many of those researchers that you listed there are actual graduates of here. So about they, half, I think. Yeah, they they know the kind of position that the students are in and the, the kind yeah, of yeah. pressure they're under and all that. So definitely, that's David. So yeah, so um, is there a, an option to give a show of hands on how many people are thinking of having a go, thinking of putting the one pager in? I'm Just not sure if I enable Let that. Let me see. Ah, there is, yeah. They can raise a hand. Yeah, if you're if you're not in, you can't win, as they say. So uh, yeah, yeah. So I have one, I have one hand up anyway. So the deadline is is. Uh, the Wednesday of this week, you said, is it Wednesday? Wednesday of this Wednesday of this week, yeah. Okay. Um. So it's yeah. Look, and when I say one page, guys, it is literally a paragraph or two will do, and a sketch, even if the even if the sketch is on a is on a a a, a sticky note. It's yeah. just to put your name in, and then we'll have a chat about it. You know. So that's great. Yeah. Okay, uh, we leave it to them, David. Thanks a million for yeah. that. A hundred percent, and thanks very much for the opportunity, Dermot. No worries, no worries. Best, best of luck with the final year projects in college in general, folks. And hopefully, I'll see a few of you up in the Walton. Talk soon. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Okay, uh, that sounds like a very valuable uh, resource to you. So it's uh, it's up to you whether you want to avail of it or not. Okay, we'll try and get back to lecturing. Let's see.
Okay, uh, so I was talking about the internals of Git and how data is actually stored inside in Git. And I was saying that the files in your project, when you put them in or using the git add and git commit commands, um, when you try and put them into the repository, what git does is it takes the contents of the file, it computes a hash value using the shower algorithm of that contents, and it puts a physical file into the repository, but it names the file using the hash value. And it does that for directories as well, as it turns out. So that's the first thing that we've discovered about the internals of Git. Uh, where exactly are these files? Um, well, I'm showing you here in the screenshot, the inside of a Git repository. And so there's a subfolder down at the bottom there called the objects folder. And I've just highlighted one of the files in there. So there's a file with that's its actual name there. Uh, and if you counted the number of characters, what you would get is there are 38 characters in that string, in that file name. A SHA-1 a SHA one value is 40 characters. So what it actually does uh, is, what Git actually does is when it computes the 40 character hash value, it takes the first two characters and it creates a folder within the objects uh, subfolder, it creates a folder with those two values. And the remaining 38 characters in the hash value is what it uses as the file name. So if we actually looked inside this physical file, then we would see it corresponds to either one of the files in our project at a particular point in time, or it might correspond to a subfolder within our project at a particular time. Or in fact, it could be what's called a commit object as well, but either way. So uh, in terms of these files inside in that objects folder, everything as far as Git is concerned is an object. It's just the term that it uses, that's the language it uses. And I'm telling you here on this slide that there are three types of objects, which it calls uh, blob objects, tree objects, and commit objects. A blob object corresponds to a physical file in your project. A tree object corresponds to a directory within your project. And a commit then is slightly the odd one out. A commit corresponds to uh, when you actually perform the git commit command. When you uh, execute that command, the uh, git will create a commit object and inside that object will be what I'm calling metadata. Uh, the metadata would be who's doing the commit, the timestamp, and um, uh, the actual commit message, plus some other bits and pieces as well. So the first two are uh, relate directly to our project. The third one is a Git kind of specific thing. So either way, we have, uh, so if I go back to the previous slide, this particular file here, that could either correspond to a blob object, a tree object, or a commit object. There's no way of telling from the name anyway. Now there's a command, uh, and that's what you'll be using it in one of this week's lab. There's this git cat file command, and you can use that to essentially look inside any of these uh, object files that you want to. So it will show you the contents of them. So it displays information I'm saying about the about a particular object inside the Git repository, rather than you physically going into the repository and trying to open the file using VS Code or some other text editor. Uh, you shouldn't really ever do that. Uh, you would use this command instead to do it. Now you'd very rarely need to use this command to be quite honest, but uh, we just need to be aware of it anyway. It has two options, two, two command line options, the minus T option, the minus P option. When you use the minus T option, it tells you what type of object uh, are you looking at? Is it a tree, a blob, or a commit? And the minus P option shows you the actual content of the file. 
Um, maybe just before I look at, um, so if I just flip over to, uh, let's see here. And if I go into, so here's my uh, Maka lab solution project. And here's the Git repository. We know now that it's a, it's a hidden file, but if I actually go into it, and maybe if I view it in this form here, and if we scroll down, and here's my objects folder. And if I expand that, you know, there's lots of objects in there. Okay. And this is just one of them. So if we just pick it out of the bag, will you find so the, the hash value for this object begins with one C and then two F three, blah, blah, blah. So if I try and do a git cat file of that, I, I don't know what type of file that is, but so if I, I've imported the project into VS code. So that's, uh, that's the project. And if I open up my, and if I go git cat file, I did the minus P option and it was, uh, what was it? One C check again, two F three. Now you don't have to type the full hash value. First, uh, five or six characters will be enough. That'll be unique. So let's see. And voila, it actually turns out to be the, what is it? Let's see. It's one of the, it's either the test file or the, uh, it's, it's one of the test files. Well, we only had one. So it's, it's my test catalog uh, dot JS file. So that kind of, and so it's a, it's a snapshot of that file at some stage because I've done a number of commits to this repository. So uh, we don't know which commit it relates to, although we could find out, okay. Right, so that just proves that this git cat file command, if you give it a hash value, which corresponds to one of the objects, then it will show you the contents of that object. And in this case, it happened to correspond to a blob object. So uh, here I'm saying what actually happens when we do a staging. A staging, remember, is when you do the git add command. And I'm telling you, I'm breaking down here exactly what happens. The first thing is it computes the hash value for every file that is tagged as being modified or untracked. And we know what that means now. So it computes a hash value for each modified stroke untracked file in your, in your working area. It actually stores those files as objects in the repository. So it does actually put them into the repository at the staging stage. And it also maintains a special file within the repository called the index file or the staging area or the cache file. And inside in that, uh, inside in that kind of administration file, it, it lists all of the files that were staged in this particular operation. So it computes the hash value, stores the actual objects corresponding to the files in our Git repository, and then keeps a list of all of the new files that it has put into the repository, or really I should say all of the new objects that it has put into the repository and what file on your working area corresponds to those objects. Now, let's prove that, right? So what I've done is, 
see now. So I've created this simple uh, folder here. And if I bring that into VS Code, So I've kept it as simple as I possibly could. So this has, let's supposing this is a, a project of ours now, and we have two subdirectories called dir A and dir B. Dir A has a file in it called file A, and dir B has a file in it called file B. And I've also got a git ignore. So I've only got three files really, uh, but a couple of directories. And the contents of file A is that, contents of file B is that. Okay, and I don't have any Git repository so far for this particular project because if I go into VS Code's source control activity, you know, it, it has realized there's no Git repository, repository there. Do you want to create one? So I'll click uh, this button here, which is the equivalent of just going, typing Git init from the command line. So it's now I've created my repository. And if I go over to my kind of uh, Windows Explorer kind of view. If I go into the project, we can now see there's a Git repository there. And if I expand it and look inside the objects folder, then there are no objects. The, these two folders here are just uh, administration files that Git uses. Uh, but other than that, it looks like that there are no objects inside in this repository, which makes sense because I haven't done any staging and committing yet. Now, if I do a staging, and I'll do it from here rather than from the command line, but it's the git add command. So uh, VS Code is telling me there are three files here that are ready for, uh, they're all on track, obviously, because uh, we haven't done any uh, committing yet. So if I, by clicking the plus here, I think I might have said this to you. By clicking the plus here, that's the equivalent of typing git add minus a from the command line. So I'll just do it from here just for sim for uh, uh, simplicity's sake. So when I click that, those three files now have been staged. And if I look inside my repository, uh, we can see them here. Okay, happens to be three subfolders as well but it has actually put the files into my repository as objects. It has computed the hash value, et cetera, et cetera. So that actually happens all, uh, when you do a staging. Um, and I suppose, okay, let's just prove it even though we hardly need to, if I take any one of them. So if I take the first one, 3D9A, And I do a git cat file on that. See? So it turns out to be um, file A, corresponds to file A. And we could do the same for the other three objects. Okay, so staging does mean it actually adds the files to the repository, but they're just standalone files. They're not kind of linked into any directory hierarchy yet. When I do a git commit, and uh, let's just do that. So, um, well, sorry, before I do that, let's go back to the slides. So I, I've, I've kind of proven, if you like, that this looks to be correct. It has actually stored the uh, modified or untracked files in the repository. Uh, 
that's fine. I'm, I'm not showing you this index file. We don't really need to look at it, but uh, it just has a list of the objects that it has added to the repository. And then we have also proven that it has computed a hash value for each of those objects. So that's that's what happens when you do a stage. What happens when you do a commit? I'm saying it computes a hash value for each directory uh, associated with an object that it has just put in from the staging. So that's, this is where the directory kind of uh, structure comes into play. So for each file that was added as a result of staging, it now computes a hash value for that for those files containing directory. Um, and it stores those directory files as tree objects within our repository. And finally, it creates a commit object, stores that in the repository as well. And the commit object will contain just some metadata about the commit, like who, who made the commit, when was it made, and what's the uh, what's the commit message and some other in, important information as well. In these in these directory file or tree objects that are put into the repository, those objects will essentially contain details about the files uh, the files associated with those directories. So that's really what allows us to it to recreate the entire project structure. Uh, at any particular point in time. So let's let's do the commit. Now, if I now just do a git log, might be the easiest way. If I go git log. Remember this shows me a log of all the commits and this value here is important, okay? That's, sorry, this value. That's the hash one, that's the hash value of the commit object in my repository. Now, if I was to look at the, the objects folder within the repository, I would definitely find a subfolder called C5 and a file within that beginning with 9F7, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Let's just see. C5. There we go. So that's the that's the object corresponding to this permit metadata object for us. And if I do a git cat file on that one. So let's do that. Again, you don't need the full hash value, so anything close to it. It's fine. Now, what it's giving us here is, this is the, the metadata, as I'm calling it, associated with the commit. But the very first part of it is really important. You can see the very first line in the uh, contents of the commit object is a tree. And a tree, remember, is its term for a, a folder. Right now, just give me one second. Um, this this line here. So it's pointing at it at a, at a a tree object which corresponds to a folder within our project. Now, the tree object it's re related to is the base folder of our project. Every commit object is going to contain a reference to the base folder of your project. And it is essentially the status of the base folder at the time of that commit. But if I take the hash value of this guy, 
and do the git cat file on that, what it'll show me is the contents of the base folder of your project when you did this commit. Maybe not. And lo and behold, it actually corresponds correctly because it's telling me, uh, this line is telling me there's a blob object. This is the hash value of the blob object. And it corresponds to the actual file called .git ignore. So that's how it actually, it does actually recall the names of the files in the repository, but there aren't files with those names, if you like, in the repository, as we've shown. The files in the repository contain the hash values. But when you look inside any tree object, that's where you get an understanding of the structure of your project in terms of files and folders. And that's how Git records it. So it's telling me that in the base folder, for this particular commit in the base folder, there was a blob, i.e. a file, called .git ignore. And if you want to look at the contents of it, then go look at that blob object. There is a second, uh, this entry is telling me that there is a subdirectory within my base folder called dir which there is. The third entry tells me that there is a another subdirectory called dir b, which there is. And that is the entire contents of the base folder. If I take this tree object and do a git cat file on that, hopefully, well, you might be able to guess what it's going to come back with. If I do a git cat file, as in show me the contents of the tree object corresponding to this particular hash value. Well, it's telling me that inside in that tree stroke directory, there is a single file, i.e. a blob, and the name of the file is uh, file A. And if you want to look at the contents of file A, then go look at that particular blob object. So that's how Git stores your project's file and folder structure internally. It stores it as a combination of tree objects and blob objects. And so for each commit, every time you do a commit, it's storing a snapshot of the project's structure at any particular point in time. If a particular, if a, if a file has not been modified since an earlier commit, it will actually refer to the earlier commits representation of that file. So it doesn't make copies of unmodified files, if you like, is what I'm trying to get at there, I guess. Um, so it's it looks tricky initially, but uh, believe me, it actually is quite straightforward when you get, when you sort of play around with it, and that's what you're going to be doing in tomorrow's, uh, one of tomorrow's labs. Um, right, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to stop there, I guess, uh, because the only thing I want to do is maybe do a second commit and show you how that actually creates a snapshot of the, um, of your project at any particular point in time, but I, I don't want to necessarily rush through it at this stage. So I'll pick up the story tomorrow morning. As I said, I'll, I'll give you a lecture in the morning because I'm going to talk about branching as well. Uh, so it'll easily be an hour long. It may be slightly longer than that. Okay, uh, I'm going to leave it at that for now. And I will touch base with you again tomorrow morning. Thanks. Thank you.